I'm here with Mike McAllitz and, and Beth Chapman of the White Dress Society. So, of course, Mike has written Profit First, which many of you have gone through. He's also written many other business books, including the most recent one is Clockwork, which is amazing, which is one of the things that I would like to delve into today. Things that I really want to touch on today, the way that the indust bridal industry is shifting, and then <clears throat> really dig into some of the issues in, in Clockwork, which is running your business on automatic. Be sure to hit subscribe for more videos on building the profitability of your bridal business. So before I do that, I'm going to give Mike a little bit of the context of what's going on in the bridal industry. There's really this changing market demand uh, in the industry, which of course, Mike, I know that you're familiar with this uh, in general as the the online space is coming in and and mm -hmm. that there there is more availability of uh, bridal gowns online as there is in other industries. The other challenge that people are facing is that uh, there is more there are more retail options for people. There's more um, casual retail options and as the customers are shifting, so there is more of a demand, more casual options for, for customers or you know even more casual weddings. So uh, retailers like Nordstrom chain retailers, but including Nordstrom's um, anthropology retailers like that, then there are, is uh, increased competition in, in that regard. So the industry is going through a period of contraction where there is competition, where competition didn't, um, wasn't as fierce before from those sources. Uh, the other thing is changing customer habits because there's a generational shift and there's a shift in what people are looking for. So what is also happening is these changing customer habits. So we have uh, brides coming in and they're coming in with a whole entourage. They want to shop at multiple stores. But when you look at that in the context, that's not necessarily a bad thing um, because it still is an indication that they're looking for that in-store experience, but it can be frustrating on the part of bridal store owners who are now needing to do more work to service those brides. So what that translates is into is um, more work for less money, so decreased margins. And so we're needing to do a lot more work in terms of needing to make up for that and increase the margins and also changing the way that the, that the bridal stores are selling to those brides and understanding those ch changes in, in habits. And Beth does a lot of work in terms of the sales and, and selling to these new brides. And that's kind of her area of expertise. The successful bridal stores are doing um, a lot of the following. And this is a lot of the work that the people in here have been doing as they move through uh, my program is that we've done some work with, I've introduced them to Simon Sinek, so uh, understanding their why in order to produce the an experience, a unique experience of reasons that they're coming to the store and not just the, uh, the, the gown as the commodity. And so understanding their why so that they can really define their experience and understanding their avatar, who they're selling to very specifically coming out of that why? But I would say that people are really still struggling to define that experience. And um, Mike has done a lot, has, has written on this um, in The Pumpkin Plan and the importance of really defining your niche, which is also uh, in line with the work that we've done as well in this area. Um, the other thing that we've done in our program is defining quarterly objectives, another thing that Mike teaches on as well. And so we've used objectives and key results to do this. And then we're building systems around, uh, you know, once they're doing that, objectives and key results, then building systems around that. And I would say that a lot of people here, this is very a very nascent concept for them. And so that's why I'm really excited to bring you in, Mike, so we can really start delving into now that they're starting to get into the concept of, of, of defining those objectives and key results, getting on that 90-day cycle, then um, starting to understand how they can build systems around those. So that's pretty much the context of where mm -hmm. we're starting from. Got it. Um, so the first thing that I want to talk about is the shifting industry and 
marketplace and really kind of get your perspective on this before we get into the kind of nitty gritty clockwork stuff. And so there's this feeling among bridal stores that the sky is falling. Right. <laughs> and well, welcome to every industry. Every industry <laughs> thinks they're falling. Yeah. You're, you're not alone. I get it. I get it. Yeah, exactly. And I think that it's important to step back. And I know that you have this 40,000 foot view. You've seen, you've run your own businesses. You've run, um, you know, multi-million dollar built and run multi-million dollar businesses and sold them. You've had the privilege of coaching, mentoring other businesses, researching, writing books, and really seeing ac across multiple industries. And, you know, I would love to get your perspective on, you know, I think that disruption is the rule rather than right. the exception. And so when people have this sense of panic about, okay, the sky is falling, this, this industry is done for, you know, what I have said is, okay, well, there's disruption is the rule rather than the exception. There's always winners and losers in periods of disruption or contraction. Can you speak based on your experience, what you've seen with, you know, give any given industry, yeah. what you've seen in these types of situations? Yes. And so, um, you know, when the sky is falling, it isn't an end of the industry. It's usually the transformation of an industry. I call it the water, the water bed effect. I don't know if, if you grew up in the seventies like I did, but, uh, uh, I remember my uncle had a waterbed, and if you jump on one side, it would cause this big wave to go across, and you pop up on the other side. So my sister and I would be jumping on the bed and flipping each other off on uh, on this waterbed, and that is what happens in industry. When we see a downward pressure somewhere else, there's an elevation inevitably somewhere else, and we just need to be very cognizant of it. I think I don't know anything about the I know very little about the bridal industry. I know um, a little bit more about the transportation industry, specifically private transportation with the rise of Uber and Lyft. So I've been doing a lot of research around that recently. And there's an interesting phenomena, not with Uber and Lyft, but with the taxi cab drivers. They go through, any established industry goes through the, uh, was it the seven stages of grief? First there's shock, then there's denial, then there's anger and rage, then there's, you know, uh, pity or whatever, grieving, recovery, like there's all these different stages. And uh, so if you remember the introduction of Uber and Lyft, is that 10 years ago now? I actually can't recall off the top of my head. But when that came about, first taxi cab drivers were saying, this is a fad. Uh, this is the dumbest thing ever. You know, we're sitting waiting for you. You got to call someone to come. Taxi cabs are going to dominate. This will go away. Then becomes the anger because it's not going away lawsuits. Uh, I don't know if the airports you traveled to were the same as the ones I went to. Uber would be there one day and the next day it'd be banned. The next day it'd be back. It was like this flip-flopping because of all these different lawsuits. Then there's you know, this grieving period. We're dying. The sky is falling. The smart taxi cab driver said, oh, why don't we maybe become Uber or Lyft drivers? Others said maybe there's an opportunity to change the service. Maybe uh, customers actually want more convenience than taxi cab drivers offer, but maybe there's a faction that want maybe higher degrees of an elegant experience. Uh, so there was actually a surge in limos that leveraged it the right way by offering a service that some guy picking up in his Camry can't offer when you come with this beautiful limo. So some people actually elevated their service because there was this greater uh, disparity in what was being offered. So I suspect the sky is falling in the bridal industry. And I suspect if you're doing things the way that everyone else has been, or you've been doing it your routine way for a long time, it's going to be terrifying. You're a human being first and foremost. It's freaking scary. I get it. Um, but we can respond to fear in a couple of ways. One fear, which is the most common uh, response is freezing ourselves. We just, we go in the shock and we freeze. And that's the dangerous move where we say, <gasps> what to do, and we just keep on plugging along and we always have, kind of ignoring the fa falling sky and denying it, at a certain point that will destroy us. Mm -hmm. Others run, that's an opportunity, and that's safe. And I'm not saying run away from the industry and fold your business, I guess you could, but run to a new opportunity, and others fight. And fighting head on against a, a massive movement, and, and your story against a massive movement, very difficult. A fight is becoming very innovative, finding new ways to do things. But my last thought is uh, my wife, and my daughter and me watch Yes to the Dress all the time. And I think we can embrace shows like that 
to change the industry into our favor. That you could, I think you could bifurcate customers right in the beginning when they contact you saying, are you looking for a inexpensive, affordable dress or are you looking for an all-encompassing experience where, where this, it's more than the dress, it's the process. Those addresses and that process, we have a fee for that. It's more expensive. So tell us what you want. If you're a cheap buyer, you know, maybe, maybe Nordstrom's is your solution if that's what you choose. And if you want to buy an experience, it's no longer buying a dress. It's an experience package, you know, for X number of dollars. You, it includes the dress, but you get this and champagne and, and your friends and photo. There's a photographer there. Um, so you can, you can change this movement to be your biggest advantage, like the smart limo drivers have with the rise of Uber and Lyft. Yeah. And basically it, the thing that you said that is really key here is the disparity. And, and I think that that is where the innovation is going to lie. And, you know, when it comes down to experience, it, it's at the point now where champagne is the given. And so, well, you know, when I was talking yeah. earlier about defining that experience, mm -hmm. you know, when you're talking about Uber, you know, Uber, Lyft, et cetera, uh, you know, w in the taxi cab industry, those that are not in Uber and Lyft, right? Those that are, that still have a car service, they have defined the experience of their car service so much so that they are able to survive. I mean, I, I don't know if it was you or somebody else that had the definition of those, those local stores where, or sorry, sorry, those local businesses where you can actually, you're in a bar and you can physically push a button and the car service comes up, mm -hmm. right? So it's like, that level of what is it that differentiates you? You know, there, there's, three, there's three competing mechanisms that we have available. One is you can compete on cost. Um, you can compete on convenience or you can compete on quality. And I, for a small business, competing on cost is the riskiest move, but so many businesses try to do it. Price cuts, price slashes, big sale for the day. The problem with competing, competing on cost is a bigger uh, – buyer, a bigger uh, seller, which means they're also a bigger buyer, can beat you on volume. Walmart, if I start a little retail store next to Walmart, Walmart will kick my ass every single day. So I rarely suggest competing on cost unless you're in a very specific market where that would serve you. Um, competing, competing on convenience is where something is accessible, uh, easy to acquire. A great example of this is McDonald's. McDonald's does not have the cheapest hamburgers. So some people think that, but you, the cheapest hamburger is actually at the food store. You can make your own hamburger for about one-fifth the cost. But McDonald's position themselves to be the most convenient. The second you have a hunger pang and you're driving down the highway, McDonald's has timed its billboards that the stores are usually within a 15-minute um, distance of every billboard. And they try to space them out that way. So when you feel a sensation of hunger, we'll go about 15 minutes before the hunger starts to build and say, I need to eat. And McDonald's has positioned themselves that way. And uh, a lot of people deny eating at McDonald's, but we actually go because it's such a convenient choice. It's our guilty pleasure is how we define it. Um, so convenience is an option. Convenience usually has to be a middle of the road price. That's what McDonald's is doing. Um, but you need to have availability. Now, or you can do with special mechanisms like that bar where you have a button right there and we'll get a car to pick you up. I would say that's more of a added uh, accoutrement than as opposed to something that makes the bar more convenient, but does make transportation more convenient. The, the opportunity to compete for most small businesses is in quality. But quality is a nebulous term because quality doesn't necessarily mean the quality of the dresses you're selling. That's one definition. It's the quality of the experience. Um, is it a unique and different experience? That's the key. Um, there's a restaurant in, I think it's in Florida called uh, Dick's Last Resort. And uh, I study them. I have yet to visit. I got to get down there. And they purport to have the rudest service at all restaurants. And if, it becomes a mockery and a jokery. But uh, they have these obnoxious waiters and waitresses. And as a result, they have a queue, a line of people uh, waiting throughout the day to get in there. There's usually an hour to two hour wait because of the uniqueness. Now, there's another restaurant. Uh, I can't remember it. It's in Savannah. Uh, I can't remember the name of the restaurant that only opens uh, three days a week for lunch or four days a week for lunch. And people queue up about six hours before to get in there because they only serve a limited amount of food. But the food is of such great quality that people rave over this place. 
So a quality is do you have a distinct, distinguishing factor that the rest of the market isn't doing? And can you take it to an extreme where no one else is touching it? You could have the ugliest wedding dresses or the darkest. Like what if you just went after the goth community? We only sell black dresses or something like that. It's, it's when you go, to, that's, that's a quality move. When you go into an extreme differentiator, that brings a perception for that community of, of quality. So don't get trapped in, I have to have the best. Quality means you have to have the most different. And that's the arena that I would look into. Yeah, and this is where I think that in this industry, it's important to tie that to tie your niche, your market, your marketing to identity. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, because, you know, who, who does your customer think they are? <laughs> yeah. I mean, your example of, what was it, Dick's, where Dick's they're right. going to pay for crappy service. <laughs> they're going right. mean, to, you know, it's like, isn't that part of identity? Isn't that part of, you know, like, oh, Absolutely. well, I, isn't that speaking to something in, in somebody's identity that like, oh, well, this place doesn't give a <laughs> so I should get that out. <laughs> no, yeah, leave it. In. <laughs> but in this industry in particular, you know, you want people coming in, or, or people are going to be drawn to you. They're going to come back to you. They're going to actually buy their dress, which ultimately is a commodity. They're going to buy their dress from you because it's speaking to them as a person and some and something that is like tied to their mask. Yes, or all brand affiliation works that way. We buy something because it's it's it, it represents us in some way it's you know it's particularly clothing right it represents who we are um and um i was thinking of the savannah bananas it's a baseball team uh in in also uh, uh savannah georgia and um what is interesting they're in the minor league baseball industry if you will i don't know if you've ever been anyone's been to a minor league baseball game but like any other baseball game they discovered that baseball is kind of a boring sport and uh, the t- attendance to these minor league games is nearly nil, a couple hundred people if you're lucky. Savannah Bananas is the only baseball team in the world, including Major League Baseball, to sell out every single baseball game for three consecutive years. They've always sold out the next season, so it's going to be a fourth year. But when I say a sellout, not just selling the tickets, physical attendance surpasses seating. So it's standing room only as a place. They get like four or 5,000 people per game in a stadium that can sit 3,500 to 4,000 people. And what they did is they went to an extreme. They, they realized that people that were coming were often coming with their family, and they were really looking for family entertainment. They saw the falling uh, clouds, if you will, the falling sky in the circus industry, Ringling Brothers, this great collapse. And like the waterbed, they decided to pop up with that. They said Ringling Brothers may be going away, but the desire to have family-friendly entertainment isn't. Well, the Savannah Bananas have gone extreme. It's, it's, it's like going to a circus that happens to have a baseball game uh, played out during the little breaks between the entertainment. So that's what the opportunity is. What can we do to, uh, to be significantly different? And I, and I want to share one other thing. I believe the essence of your differentiation in your business is really the essence of who you are. It's funny. I was giving a lecture yesterday to computer businesses, computer guys, and uh, exact same problem. Computer industry is going away. It's being commoditized. What do we do? We're in trouble. So we were talking about the exact same topic. And um, my question to them, I said, well, what makes you unique? And they went to the standard fair. Everyone else says, we're certified. We're professional. We care about your small business. We'll make sure everything works so you don't have to worry about it. I'm like, that's what everyone says. Who gives two flying Fs over that? I want to know what makes you really different as a person. And uh, there was one person, not in this audience, but there was one person who dominated the industry. You probably have heard in passing or maybe even experienced a company called Geek Squad. And uh, Geek Squad, what these guys are, they're the same computer guys as you get anywhere else, but they wear glasses with tape, they wear the flood pants and the short tie. And um, what this owner did was he had a passion for costume. In fact, he was known to wear Batman costumes to high school class. And yes, everyone else at the school make fun of him, but he embraced that idiosyncrasy, made an amplification, and grew a company that sold for hundreds of millions of dollars to Best Buy or CompuSA or whoever bought it. My, my point is, be very reflective of your own idiosyncrasies. Often the things that you were made fun of for doing, you behaved a certain way, but it's true to who you are. 
Can your bridal shop be an amplification of that? Can you bring it out in such a unique way? Because there's a community of people that starve for that. I get there's commodity buyers, but that's just, they're, they're the transaction people. There are certain buyers out there who are truly looking for a unique experience. And instead of trying to serve all people who are looking to buy a dress, let's try to find the community who's looking for a unique experience and in a flavor that speaks to you. Because if it speaks to you, you'll deliver on extremely well and it'll speak to that community. And then you can charge a, a serious premium. So. so Mike, that's a question I have actually. Um, I totally agree with you. We talk about this all the time, the importance of A, identifying who you are as a company and what your, um, what you stand for as a company and how do you align that with your target bride. But the challenge that I hear back often from a lot of bridal store owners is we are not selling a service, we are selling a product. And we are tied to certain markups. So meaning we can only sell a dress for so much. There's only so much margin for us to play with. So often in order for us to create this exceptional experience that we all want to do, and of course has to be personalized to our store and personalized to our bride, it can be expensive. Yeah. So how do you combat that? So uh, by saying, first of all, bullshit. Um, and I want to say that because I want people to be like, what? You're not selling a commodity. You're not selling a product. You are selling a service. Um, this, the product is the souvenir. The dress is the souvenir. That's the leave behind. If we look at this, the dress being the, the core component, we're going to believe that we're in a commoditized industry and we have to compete on price. When you look at a service around it and then you just walk out with the gift that you're going to remember the event by, that's the perspective I want you to take on. Here's an example. Uh, there was a company that sold iPhones down the street. And you know, I'll tell you, it's a difficult industry to be in, according to them, um, to sell such a commodity. Because an iPhone, you can only sell for one price and you can only buy it for one price. So the only way to win in the iPhone market is on volume. You got to keep the volume going. Unless you do what we did down there. We said, well, Let's, what if we said the iPhone's the commodity, or I'm sorry, the, the souvenir? What could we do to make this into a service experience? I said, what do you know about the iPhone that maybe isn't common knowledge? And this, the guy who owned the store is like, oh, there's a lot of hacks you can do. You can, I don't know if you know this. If you ever watch your iPhone at night and you turn it down to like the dimmest setting, it's still too bright. There's a, a hidden technique to actually dim it down even further so it doesn't blow out your eyes. It's unbelievable. I'm like, why is no one know this? They're like, ah, there's so many different things you can do but no one knows that even though they want it. There, there was a way, I just get all jacked up about this, I couldn't believe this. You ever have to, you put your finger down and you're trying to move it around to insert it, uh, uh, the, the hash, whatever it is, between some letters so you can make a, an edit. Did you know you can hold down the space bar on the screen and then it'll move all, you can move the cursor anywhere you want. It's like a thousand times easier. I had no idea. Well, he had, he had about 50 of these hacks. So we made a, uh, not CD-ROM, but, but like a jump drive you got with it. And now he bundled the iPhone with the, the hack system. And he was able to charge, I think he charged an extra $50 for the package deal. The iPhones, every time he had a transaction, he was making 30 bucks. It was the fixed cost. To make this little jump drive hack, each one cost about a dollar and he marked up $50 more. And people were going to this store to get that because it was included when you bought the iPhone. That's the perspective I want you to look at it. The dress is a commodity. Um, what can you package around it to increase the value? And don't sell the dress. Sell the dress as the benefit gift you walk out with. Sell the service set. Sell the service set and, and package it together. So you can have and give it, you know, the platinum bridal experience. The platinum, you know, bring five of your favorite guests. Yeah, the champ so champagne's generic. Don't do champagne. Bastardize it. Say everyone serves, you know, whatever the cheap champagne is. You know, we bring in Camus red wine from, you know, the special vineyard. We have a sommelier who presents it in front of you. You know, think of these extreme things you can do. We have a photographer that you'll, you know, of your experience. So you'll never forget the experience of selecting a dress with your loved ones. That's the way we need to think if we're going to break out of it. It's that thought that, oh, we're commoditized. We're competing against everyone else that keeps us trapped there. So I know I got a little jacked up, but I, I'm trying to give people a little shake and say, no, no, you got to think different. Yep, you're exactly right. So I want to talk about clockwork, make sure we, that we have enough time for that because uh, the concepts that you talk about in clockwork and everyone here, if you have not read the book, I mean, I sent out, I posted on Facebook, I sent out emails. I was like, you have to read this book. And if you don't have time, go watch the YouTube videos that we did like eight months back. Oh, awesome. If you don't have time to watch all those, then just watch the ones on the Queen B-roll and then 
do them all later. But what I am going to do is I am going to assume that you have all read the book <laughs> and then you can go back and read it because we're posting this later and I want to make the most of Mike's time here. So, <clears throat> so, uh, so go back and read it because you will get so much out of it. The first thing I want to talk about is the queen bee role, which is yeah. actually really tied to some of the things that we've already talked about in here. You even mentioned Simon Sinek in the book, in Clockwork, mm -hmm. uh, which start with why, which I think that most of the people in here have at least seen. I mean, I posted his TED talk in the program. So I think that most people in here are familiar, at least with the concept that they have not read his book. Um, so can we talk about the, the queen bee role? Why don't you give a really brief description of it? And then I'll do a follow-up question specifically for Bridal. Okay. I can, yeah, I'll give you a brief description, but if it's okay, I'll also give you a way to find it for yourself. Cause I've, I've come up mm -hmm. with a new process that's simpler than even what I have in the book. Oh, okay. Awesome. Because actually, since you wrote the book, I will say that what I've seen, uh, not necessarily in here in bridal, cause we haven't really been doing it, but just in the greater entrepreneurial community, what I've seen is that the, it's the, one of the biggest things that people struggle with. It's the biggest challenge. And, uh, yeah. And so I've subsequently simplified it, but it won't be in the book until we do uh, prior revise and expand edition, which is probably two years away. So let me give you the insight. Let me explain what it is first. The queen bee role um, is the essence of what your company's hinging its success on. It's the activity within your business that's the most important. And uh, most business owners and entrepreneurs believe that every activity is important. And that's not the truth. There's always a singular task that elevates itself to the top as being the most important. And uh, the idea of the queen bee role is if you're delivering on this, your business will sustain. And if you crank it up, your business will grow. If you are kind of ignoring it or don't know what it is, often the business will get stuck. Most businesses stay in this oscillation of not moving forward, you know, making a couple more sales and think they have and they slip back and they're confused and frustrated. And the reason is they haven't identified the QBR. Now the QBR came from my research um, to try and business to find business efficiency. I find often nature has a solution, discovered beehives, and uh, beehives, you probably have noticed, very efficient in growing. You see a bee flying around your window, morning one, morning two, there's that entire hive there. So I asked how they do it. Every bee is programmed to know a simple two rule set. Rule one is protect the most important function of the hive at all costs because this function determines its thrivability and survivability as a hive. And what that function is, is the production of eggs. Um, you may not know, but bees live depends on the species, like four weeks, maybe four or five months. So there's, there's a lot of turnover in beehives. And so what every bee knows is if, if we're not producing eggs as a hive, we're in trouble. Just so happens that there's a singular bee in a beehive called the queen bee who actually produces eggs. And uh, I'm not equating that to business. I'm not saying there's a singular person at your shop. There may be, but I'm not saying that's necessarily super healthy. And bees know it too. The queen bee serves the most important role. She is not the most important bee. They have equal uh, importance. If the queen bee is failing to produce eggs, they will remove her, often by eating her, and then they'll spawn a new queen bee. So all the bees know that if egg production isn't happening, they have a responsibility to move that along. Um, so bees will actually rub their wings together to bring heat to the hive in the colder months, and uh, they will uh, fan the hive with their wings, to, like almost like air conditioning, to cool it during the hotter days so that the egg production can continue on. That role is critical. Then the bees, once they are make sure the eggs are humming along, so to speak, they will go and do whatever their primary job function is, collecting nectar and so forth. Here's how... I want to equate it to business and how you can find it. Every business has a big promise we make to our customers. Sadly, most small businesses don't know what the big promise is. We haven't defined it. We actually, we overpromise. We say, we'll do this, we'll do that, we'll do this. We need to determine what is the singular biggest promise we're making to our customers, the biggest guarantee. And if you don't know what it is, just call your customers and say, why do you buy from us? What's the biggest reason you buy from us? They may tell you the promise that you're delivering on that you don't even know. And look for the singular most common answer. The example I like to use is FedEx because we all probably use FedEx. We all know the brand. FedEx's biggest promise is the delivery of packages on time, right? They've been a commercial if it absolutely positively needs to be delivered on time. So that's the promise. Now, FedEx does other things. They have print shops and, you know, they can do packaging for you and so forth. But the big promise is on-time package delivery. When we know what the big promise is, to find your QBR, just peel the onion back one layer and say, what is the singular most important activity that makes that promise a reality? And for FedEx, it's the logistics of packages. So when, uh, 
well, they, they, they have customer service, they have all these different functions, but when FedEx um, is, is moving their business along, they make sure logistics are fine. If they said, you know, forget logistics, FedEx would, would be compromised. And the irony is FedEx could say, you know, customer service, let's stop doing customer service for a week or two. Let's just make sure packages are delivered on time through logistics. Would, would FedEx go out of business? No. I mean, there'd be complaints and people saying, what's happening with FedEx? They don't answer the phones, but my packages are getting on there, there on time. There wouldn't be, uh, it wouldn't put them out of business. The reverse though is not true. If FedEx said, you know what, forget about logistics. Let's amplify customer service. Let's be the most friendly customer service on the planet. We, we, we may notice they're super friendly, but packages aren't being delivered on time. I'm not using FedEx. That's why I use them. I'm going to UPS. Or I'm going to the postal service. So FedEx would go out of business if they stopped the QBR, the logistics. And that's the risk we run for our business. You have to know what's the one singular biggest commitment you make to your customers. Determine that. Define that. You can pick it yourself or you can ask your existing customers and they can tell you what it is. You know, the most uh, romantic experience of your, of your life or the most um, fun uh, a, a group can have, whatever it is, but define what it is. The, um, then um, peel back the onion and say, what's the one activity? And I know there's many, but what's the one most important activity making that promise true? All the other activities have to be in the ballpark. You have to do well at them. But the singular activity you must always push forward is that QBR. So that, that's, that's what the QBR is, and that's how you find it. The big promise is the activity behind it. Given our, our earlier conversation about you know, gowns, selling gowns, being a commodity versus the experience, the important, yeah. uh, importance of the experience, delivering the experience. I'm sure that there's some confusion about the QBR, but I want to open this up and see if there's any brave souls that want <laughs> to try to articulate their QBR, their queen bee role. Um, and the two points that I want to pull out here about the queen bee role is that one, it's a role, it's not a person. So it's a role and that, in that it's an activity, right? So what our queen bee role is? Yeah. Our, our, yeah. Um, our QBR Okay, Mike, I don't know if, I don't know. I think it's this. That sounds so, very normal to already be questioning. <laughs> I, get, I get it. I'm afraid. But what we have defined as our QBR is creating um, a, 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 an amazing client ex experience for our client. So okay. we're so, not about selling wedding dresses. Okay, so I, I would argue without knowing much besides that one sentence that I wonder if that's the promise you make is an amazing experience. But let me, let's dig in a little deeper. What may, what's the most amazing part of the amazing experience um, that you deliver to your brides to be? Um, the most amazing part is that we lead with compassion. So we do everything with compassion in mind and we try to make this experience as enjoyable, but as easy and painless as possible. We always say that we're here to help her to buy a dress instead of selling her a gown. Okay. So, so I love it. So instead of uh, an amazing experience, you're, you're delivering the most compassionate buying experience for the, their, you know, one event in their lifetime. Is that yes. okay? Yes. Then I ask, so if you're delivering the most compassionate, what enables you to deliver the most compassionate experience of all the things you do? I know you do a lot, but what one most important thing makes that compassion experience a reality? I think it's the way that we um, we treat her, the way that we interact it, with our client. Okay, so I want to know about the interaction. Is it there's a communication? Are you asking really detailed questions? How do you, how's that compassion come across? We're asking very detailed questions. So we okay. pre qualify her before she walks through the door. We try to get to know her and develop a relationship before that she, before she even comes in. So when she comes in, we have a familiarity, we have a relationship that's already started. And we can just get to the business of helping her find her gown. Yeah. The way you can just rattle it off now, that's, I know that's your QBR. So your QBR is that intake, that, that the detailed knowledge you have of this person, far beyond what Nordstrom's or one of those stores will ever do, you Correct. get to understand, right? That's your QBR. So here's the thing is if I would say you got to know more about them and keep elevating that. You make it, make, whatever will elevate you to the compassionate, the most compassionate um, bridal shop ever keep elevating it. and the method is your QBR which is that intake the inquiry and I'm not saying I like, go to a creep factor or some weird thing where you have okay. you know 10,000 questions and stuff right. but maybe you can have some cool ways of, do, of learning about them um, over time um, maybe you can do some out of those box things there's a thing called the ediogram or something that's becoming super yes. popular yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Like, how, do you, how many people do that on brides 
where you understand what will resonate with them um, and how they'll be perceived by others. Like, you know, maybe, maybe there's something there. Um, but that's your QBR is the, the intimate knowledge that you're gaining about the customer. And so I would, my challenge to you is always elevate that. You have to do the other things. I can't, like you, you got to show up. You got to, if you got to do the champagne, you got to do the champagne, but you can get the, the, the cheap stuff here. What matters is pure compassion through inquiry, but comfortable inquiry, conversational yeah. inquiry. That's your QBR is that activity that, but you also have to know that delivers compassion. Like that's always the two that come in play. The big promise is compassionate purchasing experience. QBR is the activity of collecting that data so you can show the most compassion and care. Perfect. In my opinion. Love it. Is it we'll, do, we'll do one more if somebody else wants to take a stab at their QBR. And if you feel uncomfortable, you can just start off with, I have a friend who is curious. So. <laughs> I have some more friends. Yeah. yeah, that's how I do. <laughs> okay, I, I saw An Angela. Hi. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Um, so kind of similar to what Beth's saying, I mean, right away, experience is what we are known for. In fact, our customers have sort of created that brand for us. I mm -hmm. mean, over the three years we've had the business, this is what I hear over and over again from them is it's, they come to us because they heard we have an amazing experience. We make them feel comfortable. We make it fun, relaxed, and make them feel good. Mm -hmm. So I feel my role as the queen bee is to create that environment that we can deliver that to, mm -hmm. to give my staff the tools so that they, you know, everything that they need to be able to deliver that kind of an experience and give them, you know, make them confident um, so that they can relax and then have fun with the, with the bride, those mm -hmm. kind of things. Um, so environmentally, and like I say, those tools that make it easy for them to just have a, have a good time. So I, so that sounds like great. It sounds like a really powerful HR system you have and, and that you're empowering your team, but for what end game? And what I mean by this is when customers leave, you're talking about the experience. What, what specifically are they saying about the experience? This was remarkable because. Probably because we were able to make them feel really beautiful. Okay, right. So they okay. encouraged them to buy a dress because they felt really good and they were at ease. Okay, so the, your ability to make a, a person feel extremely beautiful, that's your promise. Then my question is, what of all the activities you do, what is the activity that most allows you, what are you doing to make someone feel that beautiful? I think it's, the, it's building the relationship. Building the relationship with them before they come in the door and while they're there and and you know, really listening to them and paying attention and, and being honest. So let's, let's well. dig into that relationship. What are you finding out in that relationship that you build with them and the honesty? Maybe it's the honesty. I, I'm just curious what, what, what triggers in your head? Because a lot of the stuff we do is instinctual. I'm just trying to get it out. What triggers, oh, this will make her feel beautiful when you're listening to them and talking to them? I think, well, paying, paying attention, really paying attention to um, the dynamics that are happening with between them and their guests, their family members and things like that. Being, I, I don't know. I'm not sure. Yeah. It's just, yeah, it, is instinct, it is instinctual. It's like I just can yeah. tell when somebody needs a little boost in yes. making themselves feel good. Yes. So it, your QBR is in there. And the key here, the challenge is we got to remove it from instinct, which simply means it's a subconscious to a conscious level. So I believe we actually follow a rule set in our head. Um, but when subconscious means we don't even need to verbalize in our head, we just make it into a feeling. Um, but when we can't do something at, at a instinctual level, we actually consciously talk about it in our head before it becomes a, a, a feeling to do something. So when you do something so well, it becomes subconscious, therefore instinctual. We gotta actually elevate it back up to out of instinct and into a conversation. So you just keep asking questions. So you instinctually see something, but what, what do you, what are some examples like, like body shaming um, and you get triggered by that or someone talks about uh, a favorite piece of jewelry? Like, what, give me some of the things that trigger that. Yeah, it's a lot of times it's body image. Okay, I body, body that, image. Okay. Yeah, that's a big one. Okay, so then I would work through the mechanics that you're naturally doing around body image. Um, some people, I, I, and I don't know this industry at all, but have some kind of shame or self-loathing about parts of their body. 
other people want to emphasize parts of the body, and I, sus- I assume, and I suspect you actually have a recipe of how to pick this out. That, I think, is your QBR, is actually understanding perception of body. Because when you understand perception of body, you can uh, en- envelop them in a dress that delivers their perception of absolute beauty for themselves because it achieves what they want with their existing body. Um, So that I think is your QBR is your ability to analyze people's perception of body to, to deliver beauty, which is the promise. Right. So again, that's about educating your, your staff about. Oh, you've educated. I'm saying the the QBR is not the education of the staff. Right. Okay. The QBR is the, is the activity of assessing people's body perception. I, I, okay. I suspect that's it. Okay. That means you as the owner of this business need to figure out what is our formula, then have your colleagues do it. And yes, you hold them accountable to it. The interesting thing in this case is you are not serving the queen bee role yourself. Your employees are, but you're responsible to make sure that there's a consistency in this body perception method you've developed. So okay. the QBR, which by the way is the best design of a business because that means you can go on vacation for a couple of weeks. And once the, if they've nailed down this formula, the big promise of seeing beauty in thyself will continue to be delivered without your presence, which is the definition of an ideal business. Yeah, and I guess I say that creating that environment, because I am I am one of those owners that's not in the store that much. So, I love it, yeah, I love it. <laughs> so I have to make sure that they're delivering that, right? Yeah, yeah. so you know, we gotta make this formulaic, and that's what the bees do. Like the bees have a system, it's just programmed into their minds, that you know, if hive is hot, therefore cool, because egg production won't work, flap wings. You know, if hive is cool, start rubbing wings together, our, our eggs won't happen. And uh, they constantly look at the eggs with their weirdo eyes, but they constantly look at the eggs and when they see egg production dropping, uh, they start taking more aggressive action to rectify it. That's the same kind of goal that you have. Yeah, and I think this bridges well to, so there's two other topics that I want to be sure to cover before we have to wrap this up. So the first one is, uh, primary role of employees, which you talk about, and then from there going on to capturing systems. So first, let's talk about the primary role of employees. And so um, let me just give you a background for how most bridal stores operate, which yeah. is that the typ- it's typical for all of the employees to be doing sales. They're, sales, they're called okay. sales consultants or stylists. And so they're, they're doing sales, they're meeting with the, with, um, customers and helping them try on gowns and, and then trying to sell to the, the customers. Now, on top of that, many stores are assigning secondary tasks, which could be marketing, posting and social media could be administrative tasks or whatever it is. So with that in mind, um, and to get, background, there's a sticky note exercise that Mike does in his book. So um, with that in mind, that that's how people are typically operating, um, how would you advise in terms of working through uh, assigning primary uh, roles? Great question. I'll talk any further on. So um, I, most businesses, including my own for the longest time, matched people's talents to their titles. So uh, I don't have a retail business, but we have an office here of 14 people and we have a reception area and we have maybe a, a visitor once or twice a day, phone rings maybe 50 times a day, which means there's a lot of idle time, right? Because you're on a phone call for maybe a minute before it gets transferred. If someone walks in, they're maybe talking with them for three minutes. So maybe cumulatively, it adds up to um, an hour and a half of work every day, but they're here for eight hours. And I used to say, well, if you're a receptionist, you need to phone responsibility, greeting, um, but you also need to do, do light data entry, some of our social media to fill out the rest of the day. And um, what I found is our person that initially did it was amazing in how they could interface with customers and just bring them comfort um, and confidence, but was actually kind of bad at the light data entry, particularly the invoicing. Now, I also found that my salesperson, their job was, their primary job is to you know, convert a prospect into a customer, but was also to educate the customer and so forth. Um, our salesperson was good at the conversion, but not so good at the warm up of a customer and building that rapport. But I put people, I matched their talents to a specific title. And I would say the 80% of the stuff they had to do, they weren't good at. We've re we've changed things here. And the goal is to now match talent to tasks. 
get rid of, we're actually, I'm trying to get rid of all titles altogether. Like, I don't think there should be a freaking president or our uh, receptionist or anything. Just, you're just here and we exploit your talents. So someone here is the communicator. Someone here is the greeter. Like, uh, or, you know, that's more of the kind of ways we're encompassing. It's not titles, but it's their strength. Yeah. Now, our former receptionist, um, she's phenomenal at actually level one sales, the warm up and, of prospects and greeting people that come in. The formal sales person, she is much better actually at the data entry component and closing people out because they're much more kind of a methodical type person. And we, we've boosted both positions tremendously by matching talent to tasks. Interestingly, Ingrid, I saw a, a study in, I think it was Popular Mechanics, but one of these like, you know, nerdy magazines that I love. And uh, they were looking at columns, like those old Corinthian kind of columns from the Greek era. And, you know, they're solid marble. And the question they put to a supercomputer was how do you make that same column with the same strength and rigidity, but lose, use the least material? And the supercomputer crunched at it and came back with a structure that is almost impossible to explain. It was like a web-like structure. It didn't make sense. I thought it would just kind of pull out on a balanced level, a very geometric pattern, but it was this kind of strange web. And as a result, it was the lightest column that retained the exact strength of that, um, that uh, full solid column. And it used like one-tenth of the material. That should be our objective for our business. Our business shouldn't be like plug in more people, you know, I need another salesperson, I need another this. No, what are the, what's the thread of the skill we need and who is a talent that can match that and runneth in an organization? Instead of three salespeople, how do you have one extraordinary salesperson doing the, the sales and maybe the other person is a, is a greeter? All they do is the greeting and the warm of the customer and when they're ready to be, uh, you know, make their decision, they move on to this other person. You got to play with it. This isn't, a science, it's a little bit of an art, but I definitely know it's not matching tasks to title or, or talents to title anymore. It's talent to tasks. Yeah, and you know, we've had uh, lead mastermind groups uh, with most of the people in here and there's been so much frustration around the, <laughs> I think the efforts around just assigning tasks and then getting frustrated because this person just won't do this and this person won't do this. Right. 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 And so I Welcome think there's so much behind figuring out what the strengths are and then, and matching that. And there's another thing that, that you talk about in your book and, and that I have definitely found to be true, which is the accountability of a task and the accountability of a task only having that you, only one person can be accountable for a given task or there, yeah um, there was a saying more I, than one I, person i was saying it on, on my wall at my home office not here but uh it's george washington and he just had a really interesting point something to the fact he said when uh when a task is assigned to three people um no one takes responsibility when it's assigned to two people there's finger pointing and when it's assigned to one person it actually gets done <laughs> um so task by committee is the worst thing ever always assign it to one person also, I encourage you, um, and this is based upon a concept called the Pareto Principle or the 80-20 rule. When you're looking to hire someone, ask yourself, what is the primary exclusive function that they need to serve? I know they have to do other things, but what is the game-changing activity? Um, and, and you got to nail it down to one. Like when I hire a salesperson, the reason I'm hiring them is they need to be able to speak to a customer convincingly and assuredly and get that credit card. So speak to them to get the credit card. That's your primary goal. And yes, they need to know the product line. And yes, they need to know this and that. But their primary thing is they can get the credit card. Then hire someone that can get credit cards. Like what we try to do is find this magical person that can fill all these roles. Um, and that's, that's nearly impossible. The, the reason though entrepreneurs think we can do it is because we believe we can fill all the roles. The reason we believe so is not because, well, the reason we've, believe we can fill the roles and we actually kind of do is because we, our lives hinge on the success of this business, either financially or emotionally, or usually it's a combination of the two. And therefore we are so vested in the success, we will go to extraordinary measures to complete the stuff that we even loathe to do. And we'll do just an adequate enough job, but even us, even the superheroes that we are, we still revert to doing what we do best and get the most enjoyment out of uh, first and typically focus there. So, when we hire someone to do all these things and we get frustrated, I can do everything. How come those idiots can't? It's because they're not vested. They're vested in getting their simple paycheck. 
Um, and maybe over time, your culture will build the strength where they have a love and passion for your clients, but they will never have the vested degree of emotion that you have, and that's a motivator to do the hard, difficult, painful things. So don't expect to find people like that. Yeah. And by the way, if you do, they probably themselves want to be business owners themselves and will leave anyway. Yes. <laughs> They're studying you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the last thing I want to talk about in our last few minutes is capturing systems, yeah. which I know that almost everybody in here can benefit from. Yeah. And most people have a manual a physical yep. manual that they're, uh, and have put a lot of time into it and they're working to a certain extent. And um, there's multiple ways of capturing systems. And one of the things that I've been working with people with, like I mentioned at the beginning, is getting some of the metrics behind our objectives and to, to move things forward. But you in Clockwork talk about capturing systems, you specifically talk about the value of video. And yeah. I am going to put out an objection that I think is probably in people's minds when it comes to video. Yeah. With a lot of stores, there's, there's a generation gap between owner and uh, the, a lot of the sales consultants or a lot of the employees. And so the idea of, of actually getting video, getting things into a digital system, I think is a little bit overwhelming. But okay, I true. do want to talk about the value of capturing systems and potentially you know, video or whatever it is. Um, and what I want to do really quickly is, uh, so I'll put that objection out there, but then yeah, sure. there's value there. But I what I want to do is I want to ask the, um, the people in the room really quickly to, I'll put out a few questions. People can answer whatever they want, but either uh, you can either talk about a system that you're currently use, using that doesn't work and why, um, or talk about any tasks that you feel are falling through the cracks, you know, and where you're feeling pushback from your employees so that we can get something going here about how to actually start putting systems together for your bridal stores. So while they do that, do you want me to talk about the process? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I, I, cause I see many people in the, the video, just give me a thumbs up. If you know what an SOP is, just give me a thumbs up. Okay, so all oh, thumbs up. Okay, so SOPs suck. Uh, let's just get down to the table. They are horrific. Now, they, they, they were, it's, it's, like, it's like saying a typewriter is an efficient way to prepare a document. It was a necessary and very effective tool you know, 50, 60 years ago. We've modernized. Here's the problem with SOPs. SOPs take a long time to develop. Um, they take a long time to consume, and they get outdated now extraordinarily quickly in modern society. Internally, I said, I got to write an SOP for one of my colleagues. We do some shipping here. I guess you do a lot of shipping. We use UPS generally. I, over 12 days, it didn't take me 12 you know, full days, but over 12 days, probably three or four hours a day, I was working on this thing, taking pictures of what a box should look like, how we fill it. The entire UPS website, fill this in, do this. It was, it was a work of art. I dropped down this 15-page document to Jackie, my colleague, who was going to take it over, saying, Jackie, this is off my plate. This is yours now. Follow this script. And she goes, great, let's do this. She walks back in my office a minute later and says, oh, there's one problem with the SOP. I said, what? She goes, UPS just updated their entire website. None of this works anymore. And I was like, oh my God, here we go. One of the problems with SOPs is the technology we're relying on actually outpaces the, the advancements outpace our SOPs, making SOPs irrelevant. Plus they're a pain in the ass to read. They, they collect a lot of dust. A better process is captures. And let me ask you this. Give me a thumbs up with this. Uh, who here has a smartphone, iPhone or others, that you know how to take a picture on? If you can take a picture on your smartphone, just I know it sounds like an idiot question, but okay, every thumb went up. Um, I didn't see white dress bridal do a thumbs up, so the one person doesn't know how to take a picture. I'm picking <laughs> one. Yeah. So, I mean, it's easy. That device, I would argue, can do almost all of the work for you. What you do is as you do an activity, for example, shipping, set up your iPhone, maybe you need a second person, filming as you speak and do the process. Then you give it to your assistant and say, watch this video. This is our best practice. Any questions you have should be answered in the video. So that's the process of transferring. Now, I know you do a lot of stuff probably on computers, order processing and so forth like that. You can do that too. You can use your phone. You can video the screen. Or you can get software, there's a package called Loom, L-O-O-M, it's free. 
Uh, you can get Loom software. We use that here to videotape the screen and listen you know, as you talk over it. So you just do the process that you've already done. The beautiful thing is a lot of people say I need to create systems, and the answer is actually you don't. All the systems are created. They just sit in your head or maybe your employees' heads. So we just need to extract it by recording it. Here's the ultimate trick, though. Once you record it and give it to your person, say, follow this script, repeat that over and over again, and they watch a video, very consumable. After they are responsible for it for a period of time, say a couple weeks, now they're taking this over, require that they then produce another video teaching the process. Because ultimately, the greatest student in every room is the teacher. If your employee can now teach the process by recording it, you know they know the process. And now that you have them recording it, if they decide to leave, you save this video on your drive somewhere on a virtual directory or on the cloud, when they leave, the knowledge doesn't leave with them because you have the recorded video. That's the standard process to capturing. Mike, I have to tell you, I've been listening to Clockwork on Audible, and I, this was like my Oprah aha moment. Oh, good, good. Oh, your UPS story. I'm huge on procedures. I have a video series for bridal store owners, and within that, there's a download that is a procedures outline for bridal stores. And I, oh, I spent so much time within my own store documenting these procedures, but lately, I've been so frustrated because I'm like... Did you listen? Like, why didn't you follow the procedures? Why didn't you follow the procedure? I'm just saying it over and over again. And you talked about the videos and I was like, oh my God, of course, this is like makes perfect sense because especially with the younger generation who's working for me, it's yeah. all about video for them. And it's something that they can play and pause and they need to and rewind. Nobody wants to sit there and read something while they're trying to do another task, but they can be listening to a video while doing the task. I was like, yes. that was that was the biggest takeaway from work for me that I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. And I just want to emphasize a point you made, Beth, is as we hire the new generation of employees, it is our responsibility to accommodate to their specialized skill set. Mm -hmm. I don't know how my daughter does it, but she will have like two videos going while doing homework for college and yes. actually absorb the videos and get the homework done. She's a great student. I don't, I, that seems like inhuman to me, but she does it. So therefore, they haven't, this new generation has an ability to uh, consume video in a way that we don't, uh, if you're an older generation and looking at you, you don't look like the older generation, I'm not implying. <laughs> but, uh, but we have to accommodate them. The, the, the second thing too, Beth, to your point is a lot of this content already exists. The beautiful thing is you might not even need to make a video. We had a problem with this thing called drain flies, these flies that were coming out of the utility sink in our basement. And uh, I'm like, what do you do? I went on YouTube and typed in drain flies and there was a solution. Pour boiling water down it and our drain flies were permanently gone. Well, the solutions for many of our business tasks are already on YouTube. How to do invoicing in QuickBooks. There's like a thousand videos up there. So you don't even have to create the video. Pick the one you like most and plug it in. And many of us use a, a, a similar uh point of sale system called Bride Alive. And Bride Alive is using this technique, actually. Their oh, yeah. frequently asked question is all videos. Yeah. So as bridal store owners, I think we're getting used to this concept anyway. And yeah. um, they're, they're utilizing that and it's, it's so helpful. So I was like, why wouldn't we translate that to our stores? It's amazing. Yep. Bride Alive is producing videos. Beth produces videos. I produce videos. And then, so if you're producing your own videos, you can catalog the videos you produce, the ones that Beth produces, the ones that I produce, and, and, and then use them. And then you can check out, when you read um, Mike's book, he also has a way of organizing them and filing them, which we're not going to get into here, but definitely read the book and think think about that. And the filing system that you talk about, Mike, and I just want to mention yeah. this for, so that you know. So he talks about organizing them using the ways that the, the business activities that we typically uh, use, which are attract, convert, oh, right. deliver, right. and collect, right? Yeah. And so actually having those in our filing system. And I just want to tell you, Mike, so when I developed the bridal chart of accounts, and I have a lesson on this in the program, I actually use those activities oh, nice. yeah. for the expenses in the chart of accounts. So um, there are some people in her already actually using those and have their expenses because I was like, what's going to happen if I do this? And it works really nicely when you use it in your profit and loss statement to organize your expenses in your chart of accounts. Just so you know. I love that you're doing it. You know, in, in the book, Clockwork, I talk about ACDC. <laughs> Not the band, even though they are kind of awesome, but whatever. Um, ACDC stands for Attract, Convert, Deliver, Collect. And every business goes through a sequence, not necessarily in that necessary order, 
but that is a fundamental flow of every single business and you can use it. I love the way you're using Ingrid. That's actually the first time I heard it in a chart of accounts, but you definitely use it for your video collection. Is this an a prospecting activity, attract? Is it conversion, sales? Are we delivering our product and service? Are we collecting the money? And each one should have you know, videos related to that. I actually would love to be able to get some people to chime in on their systems and solve those problems. But Mike, I also want to be mindful of your time. Yeah, I'm, so. I am. Uh, I'm just let me look at my calendar real quick. Yeah, I got a call in about five minutes. Okay, uh, so I, I'm going to let you, I'm going to let minutes. you bolt. Okay. Um, and thank you so much. It was just invaluable to have you oh, here. My pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> My pleasure, entrepreneurs. Thanks for having me and uh, just crush it. I, I, I like to end with this. Um, it's my joy to, to share with you. Uh, I ask that you just crush it in your business. I, our world is starving for success. And this is why I just recently figured out the more successful your bridal shop is, the more income you have coming into you, the more you can hire employees, you start changing your own family, your own community, your area, your country, and ultimately our world. So, uh, just, just crush it. All right. We need you. We need you. <laughs> I'll see you all later. Thank you so much, Mike. You've made such an impact for everybody in here. Thanks all. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.